Okay. Hold on a second. Let's see if I got it. Okay. I'm Donovan, and um, we are in the second week. No, we're in the first week. Sorry. <laughs> uh, we're going to, this is the actual scholarly content uh, for week one. And what I'm going to do is give you an overview of religious trauma at the and, and LGBTQI people uh, experiencing some religious trauma and some different world religions and spiritual traditions where LGBTQI people have been experiencing religious trauma and what the roots of those experiences might be in the sacred texts and traditions and practices of those religious communities. Um, and then next week, we're going to actually look at within all those same traditions, there are also even going back to the ancient traditions and sacred texts and current practices, there are also streams that are inclusive, affirming, and build resilience. So, so this week we're looking at trauma, but even before we go there, I want to give you a heads up that we're also going to look at resilience within these same traditions. So this is, this is just a focus on religious trauma, but it's by no means trying to portray any tradition as being inherently traumatic. I hope that's really clear before we get going. I do not want to read, this is a very, a lot of material. It's something that I normally present over the course of two full days uh, or at least a full day workshop in other settings. So I've adapted it for us, but, um, and it can even be a longer course than I'm trying to skim over a lot of material. And my goal today is to give you uh, a, a survey and then you dig in, especially during week four, um, we're not going to assign anything specific to you. I'm going to offer you some resources on LGBTQ people within specific religious traditions in week four. But so today I'm just really skimming a surface and inviting you to dig more deeply into the different resources that I'll mention today um, at, at any time point through the, the four weeks that we're together. And my slide is in. There we go. Okay, so first of all, I wanted to mention um, a specific learning goal. One thing that I wanted to do is draw on some material that came from a recent course we did in this program called Human Rights and Global Advocacy. So um, one of the things that we've been learning about over the course of this program, and particularly in that human rights class, is that usually when LGBT people around the world and in this country are um, when their legal rights, civil rights uh, are violated, uh, when their basic human rights are denied, um, that that's usually done from a religious perspective, even in countries that aren't overtly religious states. So, um, you know, we saw in the human rights class that usually what's what LGBTQ people around the world get arrested for is blasphemy laws or violating blasphemy laws or some sort of moral conduct that's really interpreted through a religious lens. Um, there's some other stuff here too, but you know, we've certainly covered in many other courses. Uh, if this is your first course with us, I just want to mention it, that there's a lot of data that shows that LGBT youth are bullied three times as much, nine to, out of 10 LGBT students report being harassed at school. And I'm kind of aiming that in this academic environment that we're in right now. And that LGBT teens and young adults are four times as likely as their straight peers to attempt suicide. So the reason I'm bringing this up is just to say that um, to be an ally, to be informed about what's going on here, lives are at stake. These, these, this interpretation of LGBTQ identity as being blasphemous or immoral is something that has life, life and death type of consequences. And I, you know, I know many of you know that, but that's why we're digging into this topic. Um, I'm sharing something that actually was shared by a student in this program initially, but um, to remember that that gender diversity in a sense is uh, it, it's it's a religious issue in the sense that many religions um, look at gender as being only male and, and 
female as assigned at birth. Um, and some cultures, as we see here, some cultures and religious religions have gender diversity built into them. Uh, when we deny gender diversity as this um, this is from transequality.org, but as, as which is a youth organization, by the way, they're a great trans youth organization. But anyway, it's it's inherently racist. So if we're if we're doing anti-racist work, which you know I know most of us now are, are if we haven't already been long time committed to that, we should be committed to that now. Um, so so dealing with gender diversity is a is an anti-racist thing to do and a an intersectional thing to do. Um, I talk about it a little bit in a lecture that Amy and I decided to make optional for you this time because there's a lot in this week's lectures. Uh, notice that we didn't give you any other course videos to look at and we, the reading is actually pretty light this week too. But there's a lot in the lectures. So um, I'm just going to say that in the optional lecture I go into this more but just to kind of revisit it quickly. Um, again, gender and sex are usually seen as basic categories in every culture and when people color outside the lines of however gender and sex are de defined in a culture of course that varies in culture from culture to culture and within cultures over time but however people are defining sex and gender at any given time within a culture when when transgressions of those boundaries happen um, societies usually feel like that's a moral threat and a threat to their group unity so they react very strongly to that. Um, it's, it's, it's like a, the threat of danger uh, and collapse of the society to them. So it, it kind of, you know, again, I go over this a lot more in that Why Building Bridges lecture, but, um, but when, we, it, when we know that, it might help us understand that the intensity that some people direct at those of us who are LGBTQI is not about us personally. We're going to see that in any society, human society where people feel like their core categories are being threatened. There's things we can do about it. We don't have to resign ourselves to that, but we're just looking this week at where the, where the traumatic, the things that cause trauma, where do they come from? So um, one of the reasons that we're spending time on this week too is to know how to be an ally effectively. You're training to be LGBTQ leaders and maybe allies. Um, so we need to know what trauma is so that we can do the, the really effective work in our community, which is to do, build resilience. And so, so we need to know what trauma is so that we know why we're building resilience and how to build resilience in ways that help with trauma recovery and help people be resilient in the face of things that are known to create trauma. You know, I hope that makes sense. But um, one of the things we can do is really basic, and this is something that uh, at, when you're when you're in a position and people do ask you to do an LGBTQ 101 or a trans 101, or um, if you're an ally and your workplace is asking you what they can do better, this is a real, real basic one. So a way to build resilience and prevent relational trauma um, or, or tr not contribute to relational trauma is, of course, to use the words that people use for themselves in terms of their gender and sexual orientation and any other thing. They let, let someone trust someone when they tell you who they are and, and how they like to, how they refer to themselves and how they want you to refer to them. So I want to talk um, now uh, about religious trauma syndrome, which is an actual well, I'll just talk to you about it. So religious trauma syndrome uh, is really what I wanted to look at this week with you. And gender and sex minorities experience that disproportionately. Um, this particular trauma comes from things that would cause trauma from anybody. Being socially excluded, being harassed, being abused verbally and psychologically, um, being, uh, you know, threats of violence, being treated as if you're not a human being, being told you're not fully human. Um, and then, you know, the religious dimensions of this include even uh, not only threats of violence in this life, but for those who believe in an ongoing, you know, afterlife to, to be raised with and internalize an idea that even after you die, you're not going to get relief from being tormented, bullied, and, and experiencing violence because who you are is so fundamentally wrong that even after death, you're going to continue to be tortured. 
course I'm talking about hell here. So um, that's very traumatizing, obviously. Uh, I would think that would be obvious. And then another trauma is to be told that um, if you're going to escape that threat of everlasting violence after death, then the only way you can do that is to live life celibate for the rest of your life and never have a partner, never raise children, uh, just go through life entirely alone and that's what you need to do. And then maybe, maybe you'll escape the clutches of everlasting torment. Um, another traumatizing thing that a lot of us older folks, but some younger folks too have experienced, I know some of my students had experienced it, um, that, I, that I've shared with you as I'm sharing my personal story, I'm sharing some things about the LGBTQI students, not, not personally, of course, but in a general way, um, some things that, that they went through. Um, so reparative and conversion therapies, um, including giving people hormones that don't match who they are, uh, certainly, you know, sort of brainwashing type of thing, but trying to turn a gay person straight or a trans person cis or whatever, uh, bi non-binary person binary, whatever it might be, but trying to fix somebody that isn't broken and and you know, for some of us went through decades of that. I was in, in reparative therapy on and off for 39 years. So that, that, and that's not unusual for someone of my generation, but particularly in religious contexts, um, many of the folks I know who are LGBTQI too, uh, and were raised in a religious family uh, underwent reparative or conversion therapies, which not only do we know don't work, but in many places around the world and in this country, they're banned because they're known to lead to suicide and, and lifelong mental health issues and so on and so forth. So um, they're actually very dangerous as well as ineffective. So here's a little something about religious trauma syndrome. Um, the person, who, the doctor who pioneered this is named Marlene Winnell. And um, it, this religious trauma syndrome is, it's a phrase that she coined to describe what she sees in people who have internalized messages from religion um, that who they are is wrong and that if they were to leave this religious community for basically abusing them, that, that they have no future and they will have no, um, no support at all. So, so if they break from their religious community, they experience this, uh, a, you know, relational trauma of all these kinds of losses and a, a, a kind of loss of meaning, their, their, their sense of purpose and the, the way, as she says here, the way that their reality has been constructed, uh, their framework for understanding meaning and reality is, is all, it might collapse or it's deeply challenged, but it's, um, it's a very traumatic thing to go through to have your whole underpinning of, of what life's meaning and purpose is. Um, it, your choice is either I get to keep that or I, or I can't be me. And so um, again, disproportionately affecting LGBTQI people. Um, what else did I want to say about this? So you know that in religious community, I'm sure you know this, in, this may not only take the form of overt transphobia and homophobia. So, so some folks go to churches or religious community where, they're, where they will hear the religious leader and their families just explicitly say, you know, same-sex marriage isn't real, it's wrong, you'll go to hell for that, or, you know, there's no such thing as trans people, or God did not make anybody intersex, they, they, you know, a mistake was made, whatever it might be. But anyway, so some people are overt with it and threatening about it, but a lot of times it's not overt. So I wanted to just point out here that for some people, um, if in many communities, communities that will claim to be welcoming, I think this is where, um, it's not just my opinion, but when we study religious trauma syndrome, this is where it really gets insidious because what happens is on the face, oh, we're a family, we're a family of faith, we're, we love everyone, God loves everyone, and that's the message in words, but the message in behavior is people are scared of LGBTQI people, they're scared their kid might be, you know, and I know some of you in this program are the person that was raised in a family like that. So, uh, um, you know what that feels like. If nobody, doesn't necessarily mean anybody said anything to you, but they might be saying things about 
make you know making jokes about gay or trans people or they just might have you know, can tell by their body language when they see a, a same-sex couple or a trans person that they kind of recoil or they seem scared so you know that's sort of a, a how, how can i say is you know it's a more subtle form that certainly conveys a message right um another thing that again you know people saying these things may come across like they're trying to be loving like that uh what is it? Concern. I forget what it's called. Concern culture. Whatever. They they they're concern trolls. Is that it? I, I, I use the phrase in the building bridges. Why build bridges? One. But anyway, um, uh, it's not a phrase I normally use. That's why I'm blanking on it. But anyway, so um, um, the idea that if they're telling you, you know, like the reparative therapy, conversion therapy type of mentality is like, oh, we love gay people and we love trans people because God loves them, but they are broken. They are, you know, they just don't know who they are. They're just confused. So um, obviously, if you're the person who's LGBTQI and you're hearing that and you're internalizing this message that, oh, who I am is sick, you know. Uh, and another one, oh, this is this is a classic one. Again, now this really is concern trolls, but warning people how dangerous it is, how dangerous it is to come out or be identified as trans. And this is this is a classic one that I've heard parents of my students and over the if you if you saw no you'll see it next week um but anyway i've spent a lot of time working with college students that are lgbtq in a lot of different contexts and that's really the sort of the classic response of the sort of passive aggressive but loving parent uh i just don't want you to get hurt nobody will want you nobody will want to marry you and i don't want you to have to spend the rest of your life alone you know people in the church won't understand the rest of the fam that was the one i heard was the rest of the family won't understand you can just never tell anyone this and this is what i was told when i was a teenager and then again when i was in seminary so i kept going back into the closet i'm not trying to make this about me i'm just saying that um those those messages of, of loving said with love that it's just too dangerous to come out um, that's that again, that, that is very traumatizing because it does uh, encourage people to stay closeted and live a double life or just deny who we are. Um, another somewhat subtle thing, passive aggressive thing, I would say, but Trump can be traumatizing or, or add a layer to this trauma is to use uh, disrespectful dehumanizing language for um, queer people and gender diverse identities. Um, when I was working with Trans Lifeline, I think, you know, I've mentioned several times throughout this program, uh, our certificate program, that, that one of the things I did is, is to help found a peer support hotline uh, to prevent suicide uh, for trans people would answer the phone to help other trans people who were feeling, you know, in crisis or at risk of ending their lives. And the, and the thought was that, you know, we've been through, the, uh, most of our volunteers by far, I think 85% or more were suicide survivors who were trans ourselves. So um, it was just a kind of, I've been there, I'm holding space for you, you're not alone. Um, anyway, so out of, out of our volunteers, um, more than a third had, had, had described themselves as having ex experienced religious trauma, um, specifically, family rejection and uh, related to religious beliefs so it's it's very predominant in um, gender minority communities one thing i wanted to look at before we get into the next three weeks where we're talking about resilience building is i want to share some scholarship on how trauma affects the body and the brain and that's why a lot of I've found a lot of uh, uh, religious folks don't necessarily take gender and sex minority religious trauma very seriously. You know, you might get a response like, well, those folks just need to toughen up or whatever. Um, so let, I do want to spend time with you or at least let you know this is here to dig into. And there's more in terms of the required readings this week and next. There's more on brain science about how trauma affects the brain and how it affects i have a, a required one of the only required readings this week is a very short little piece called for short and for future but it's about how the brain can't even imagine having a future 
the the sense of hopelessness that comes not just from not t- not being tough it's not that but it's that the brain is so traumatized it's so much in fight or flight mode that the idea of thinking about where will i be five years from now or 10 years from now or you know i'll get through this because tomorrow's another day that's not really possible when you're in trauma mode so um so i really just want to look at that with you and invite you to dig deeper into that and it equips us to understand why lgbtq people um, are experiencing such intense life or death reactions uh, when we're dealing with folks who are coming at us from a religious perspective, especially if we share that religious perspective, and they're coming at us in these these ways that we can't just easily shake off, okay? Excuse me, so I'm not, what I would really like to do in this section is just point out to you that there's a lot here for you to dig into uh, and not go through, because this is a really actually a long slideshow. (laughs) So I'd like to tell you about what's here and have you come back to what interests you. Okay, so what I want to say here is that I'm drawing on a, um, I go to a lot of trauma recovery, trauma informed care, trauma informed teaching type of workshops um, put on by providers from all over the country and sometimes all of the recently I went to a collective trauma one that was people from all over the world. But anyway, this one, um, this is a, a doctor who's pictured right here. And she was teaching about the effect of stress on the body, toxic stress. When we're talking about trauma, uh, she, she was pointing out that, that even if you don't have a full-on trauma reaction, to be constantly uh, dehumanized, harassed, and living precariously um, at, at not having basic needs met and so forth, which, again, disproportionately uh, gender and sex minorities experience homelessness, extreme poverty, and things like that. Um, that's a toxic level of stress and toxic to the body. It's not, we're, it's not just a trendy uh, expression to describe what it feels like. It's, it's literally toxic to the body and brain to be under this prolonged life and death stress all the time. So what I added to what I shared from her here is that um, the family rejection, social rejection, loss of employment, employment discrimination, uh, extreme poverty, this, this whole idea to being told that who you are is not within God's will. God doesn't create people like you and for you to live as yourself, even, even if you're unpartnered for you to just be yourself, you're violating what God wants. Now, if you don't believe in God, that's, I, you know, maybe you can just shrug that off, but for folks who do, uh, that's a, a very stressful message to hear. And of course, what, I, what I've shared with you here in the link, the, the blue text down there is a hot link to this presentation so you could learn more about what the body and brain responses to that level of stress are. But I did want to share with you um, just a quick graphic. This is from a different uh, training. But I wanted to just share with you, though, just a little, I guess, easy to remember thing is that this level of stress, this level of trauma that's chronic like this and dehumanizing and who you are is wrong. Um, this people that have suffer, suffered these levels of trauma. And again, let me, let me be a little bit more clear. Family rejection is considered not just for LGBTQ people, but family rejection is considered a major trauma for anybody. It's, and the only reason I keep bringing up, of course, LGBTQI people is for people who aren't gender and sex minorities, it's not really that normal for your entire family to reject you. That's not a super common experience for folks to have, except if you're queer or trans. And for trans people, it's much more common than it is for, for cisgendered. And I'm not saying you haven't experienced that. I'm not, I'm not dismissing anybody's individual experience. I'm only saying in terms of communities, the people that, the highest percentage of people to just experience this as a group are, are gender minorities. But um, so these kinds of traumas affect the brain like a brain injury. That's what I wanted to get to with showing you this slide the reason it's here it's about brain injury but the people who shared it um child savers is actually a, an organization that works with children who are survivors of trauma 
adverse childhood experiences. You'll see that a lot in the slides I've prepared for you for the next two weeks. Adverse childhood experiences, um, there's 10 different, 10 different uh, ones that affect children's brains that, that, that get um, assessed in this, this ACEs or adverse childhood experiences screening that uh, providers around the country use. And, um, and, and they found, as I say, that, that the stress affects you like a brain injury. So you can't just toughen up from a brain injury. You can learn to work around it. You can recover, but your brain is different. When you've experienced trauma, it's going to be different. Your brain's just going to be different. Your reactions are going to be different. And, um, you know, I know that's something I always emphasized when we were working at Trans Lifeline together is, you know, all of us have relational trauma. We're pretty much all suicide survivors. We're helping other people who are calling us to have relational trauma. So it's important to just be gentle with ourselves and be aware that our reactions are different than the reactions of people who don't have trauma. It, it's not that we can't work around it. And here's that, a link to that foreshortened future article, but it's in the Moodle website. <laughs> Um, this is another thing I wanted to show you. This has come up a couple times, I think, some, in, our, in our conversations uh, throughout the course of the program. But I wanted to just remind you that one of the things for a person who's experienced trauma, what, what that means is our brain has been in that mode. We've been in some situation we perceived to be life or death. And that can even be the threats of health thing, like I was saying before, the idea that, you know, what I'm, what I'm, uh, doomed to experience for all eternity is this huge threat. It's terrifying. So when people are faced with a life or death threat, we go in, our adrenaline system ramps up and it affects the brain. Stress hormones flood the body. It shuts down parts of the brain that aren't essential so that we can at least keep breathing, keep our heart beating and so on. But basically we go into fight, flight or freeze mode. Um, and that's, we don't have any control over that. When we perceive something to be literally an immediate, urgent life and death threat, our body's just going to do that. And it's going to, it's going to, the hormones are going to uh, flood the brain. The brain's just going to automatically reflexively switch into this survival mode. We didn't do anything wrong. It's a survival mechanism. Um, and I know I'm kind of belaboring this, but this is, I, I find that queer people tend to shame ourselves a lot for having this type of response. Um, and, and the reason I focus so much on trauma in my work now and have for the last few years is, is if there's one message I could convey to other queer people and to myself, you know, that that's helped me is it's not our fault that we react to traumatic things as if they're traumatizing. And it's not our fault that our brain and our body have had these life and death reactions when in fact, you know, we faced some life or death things. It's just the way it is. We can learn to deal with it. We can learn to recover from it faster. We can learn to help ourselves be resilient and recognize it when, those reactions when they happen, but it's not our fault that they happened. They're, this is just a human body and brain response. So I've been talking about the brain so far. So, so this kind of trauma can be like a brain injury and it can have a, it can go into automatic responses that we don't immediately have control over until we de-escalate de and get to regulate ourselves. In the meantime, when we're having those kinds of brain reactions, what this is how that level of toxic stress or trauma affects us. It affects every system of the body. I will not read this to you, but I would encourage you and invite you to come back to this to just recognize how systemic discri discrimination, threats of violence, actual violence, uh, how they affect our, our basic life functions if we've been living in this precarious survival mode for a long time for a variety of reasons. And some of those threats disproportionately do come from religious families and religious folks who are threatening to take away but our health care, threatening that we can't use public bathrooms, that we can't threaten to take our children away, you know, whatever. There's so many different layers to this. Um, yeah, it, 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 please come back and take a look at the different ways that affects a person's body. And, and we may have these mysterious ailments, you know, I, I know, especially for uh, intersex and trans people when I was first coming out and when I was working at 
trans lifeline, I was amazed how many of us had mysterious stomach ailments and mysterious digestive issues. They're not that mysterious. But again, we can build resilience. We'll look at that next week. So um, again, there's just more here. This is how now what I was looking at is how does this affect our relationships? We've looked at how does stress affect the brain? How does it affect the body? It also affects relationships. So people that have been traumatized by telling us we're not human and all these other things that some of us, many of us go through, um, then it affects our ability to trust. It affects our ability to self-soothe. Um, it affects our boundaries. And, and those things just take work. If we know this, then we can take a little, you know, my experience is that we then can experience recovery if we're willing to look at this and, and recognize this and not blame ourselves, but just say, okay, these are things that happen when somebody's been traumatized. We can help each other. This is why peer support, I've been hammering away at that for this whole program, but peer support is so important for those of us who are LGBTQI um, because we can be gentle with each other when we cannot be gentle with ourselves, you know, and if we, if we know these things, especially and know, you know, all my buddies probably have relational trauma too. And, you know, we have a, in my household, we're all, all trans adults who all have uh, CPSD, CPTSD, compound post-traumatic stress disorder. And uh, so our little joke around here is that, well, we don't all have a bad day at the same time. <laughs> and um, I mean, I guess that's not really a joke, but we always chuckle about it is that, you know, the two, one or two of us can be there to hold the other one up on, uh, you know, as, as we all have our ups and downs. And so peer support, again, can really help with the real healing from relational trauma. Um, so I wanted to look at more specific roots and causes. Uh, like I said, in the, in the slideshow that I made optional for you, um, I go into this a lot more about how sex and gender are important categories in every, every culture, and that in certain religious communities, they're going to enforce whatever their understanding of gender is in a variety of different ways. I go over what the standard, there's like five standard ways that people enforce gender and sex boundaries across cultures. Um, some lean more towards violence. You can lean toward embracing and integrating. Um, some do pathologizing, you know, there's, anyway, I went over that in a different lecture, but um, the point is that um, there are some pretty standard behaviors around gender across cultures however those genders are defined. So exaggerating the differences between male and female or, or whatever the genders are, but in, in, in cultures that are really, and, and again, I mentioned this a lot more in the Bill, Why Build Bridges lecture, but the cultures that are really obsessed with this tend to be patriarchal cultures. So the reason to exaggerate the difference between men and women is because one group has all the power and the other group has been disempowered so in order to preserve the power dynamic, uh, we have to exaggerate the differences. I don't know if that makes sense, but um, so, so when you exaggerate the differences, it's usually because somebody's trying to maintain control and, and maintain their grip on power. Um, and when we went in cultures that do that, that very binary patriarchal type of strategy, then maleness and masculinity and females and femaleness and femininity tend to be emphasized and exaggerated. So it's not just male and female as biological categories, but also gender expression, gender identity. All of it tends to be a bit more extreme because we're trying to exaggerate the differences so that we can keep one group on top and one group exaggerated and disempowered. Um, and so when all that's happening in a culture, um, the sexual relationship, the erotic desires, we've seen this in a couple different of the classes where, where the politics of desire come up in, around the world. And we've looked at that in a bunch of different ways, but um, people get really uh, intensely emotional about controlling sex. Because again, this is all part of controlling who's who and exaggerating the differences. So where all those things are very important and where that power dynamic is very important, um, 
if there's crossing of the boundaries or if there's people on the margins of all that, it's very threatening to a society that's, you know, really reinforcing the exaggerating difference in order to hold on to a particular culturally created, not innate power structure. You know, if, if they were to, and this is why they get so intense about uh, preserving it, because if they admit that there's gray areas or that there's fuzzy lines or it's, you know, it's more like watercolors than, than Sharpies, you know, um, then, then the whole structure doesn't really work. Um, if we're not that different, then why there's no reason for one minority group to be on top and everybody else to be under their control. Um, so uh, the kinds of, uh, you know, I'm not gonna read this to you. So this is just a little bit more background again about why folks um, react so strongly to this such that they inflict trauma on people that are perceived or told that we're dangerous. So you can look at this uh, if you want to, you can come back and look at that if you want to. Um, yeah, and again, I've talked about this in the other lecture that I made and in other classes too, we've talked about this a little bit. Um, but some of the things that we do, this is what I, where I really wanted to hone in. So I've already kind of, I, I think you're, you're, you've got the point that, that it's seen as dangerous to patriarchal cultures, especially to blur the lines of gender and sex um, and how they enforce that. And this is where it comes to what we'll see as we look at individual religions is they'll get legalistic. So those fundamentalistic religions, and it's not just one religion, but the strains within any religion that get very moralizing and very, you know, you have to do it this way. And there's a strict list of do's and don'ts and there's strict codes, moral codes, and you can't go outside of those. Um, so they could get legalistic about it. They could have purity codes that aren't exactly laws or commandments, but this is a common one in evangelical culture. You know, the, the uh, cult of virginity, uh, um, the, the whole, you know, I, I'm more familiar with an evangelical Christian culture, so I'm just going to give these examples because of the ones I know about. But there's, there's a trend in some, or there was at least uh, a trend of fathers giving their young daughters a purity ring that she would wear on her uh, wedding ring finger. And this was supposed to be symbolic of a pledge that she was going to preserve her virginity until marriage. Um, this is this sounds like something from hundreds of years ago, but this was something that was happening when I was teaching college at an evangelical university. This was something that some of my students had experienced. So it wasn't that long ago. And for all I know, it's still going on. I'm just not having any interactions with that culture but um but so so i bring that up just to say that it might be socially rewarded it might be in, not enforced through like threats of violence or anything but it could be um you just get yeah socially rewarded and and kind of um you know sh honor shame type of behaviors um appealing to imagine potential Social consequences, that's one that's used a lot by right-wing lobbying groups in the United States uh, when they claim that, you know, if trans women are allowed to exist, then children will get molested in bathrooms, or um, if trans people are allowed to play on sports teams, then high school girls will get molested in locker rooms or there's all kinds of stories that are made up to, to create outrage. Um, there are things that would create outrage, but the, the thing is that the, the potential social consequences that are held out as threats are things that don't happen. They're not real threats. They're, um, so they're, you know, anyway, that's a strategy that's used not just in the U.S. now, but it's, it's standard in all kinds of societies. I'm just giving you contemporary examples. And then another really powerful one, and this one is the one that um, I see the most in, in the people I know who are LGBTQ and have been raised in a religious setting or have been by choice part of religious communities for a long time is the internalized fear. In other words, the folks, even if, if the folks around us are not overtly violent, if they're using that love this, love the sin or hate the sin kind of language, that can be enough to convey a message to us that I have to hide who I am. 
who I am is seen as sin and I can't inflict that on my family and the people I love. So um, the fear of social ostracism that we internalize then shuts us down and causes us harm and keeps us in the closet without anybody else really having to do anything to us. We police ourselves because we've been taught and trained to do that. Um, I'm going to pause here and, um, and I'll do a part two of this. And we're going to actually, as you can see, the interactive map of world gender customs here, the heads up is the next part of what we're going to cover has to do with different world religions and what they specifically do, what people experience in the different traditions around the world. So, okay, I'll stop there. Trying to